It's a chess game that you play with the bees and, and nature. And it follows certain rules, but in many cases they're pretty loose and there are many ways that a season can go. When the crop is off and in the jars, you can look back and you can compliment yourself on the good decisions you made. Often it's luck, but only after you've played the game can you determine whether you've been successful or not. Hello and welcome to the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. You're listening to episode three, Working Toward the Honey Flow, written and read by Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. What you're about to listen to is a snapshot in time. When Tom wrote this piece in 1990, he described himself as a community beekeeper, a small local honey producer. There are beautiful details about clover, alfalfa, and maple what blooms when and why it matters. Stay tuned through the end to hear Tom and I chat about how beekeeping has changed since he wrote this piece over 30 years ago. My name is Laura Tyler. I'm the producer and host of the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. This is episode three, Working Toward the Honey Flow. Fifty years ago, most farm towns had one or more community beekeepers. These individuals worked within a limited area, were generally well known to the farmers and ranchers, and supplied a local market with high quality honey. Today, most commercial beekeeping operations have followed the general agricultural trend toward larger and larger holdings. They have thousands of colonies and may run their bees over a wide region, sometimes several states. Many are migratory, moving their bees to the southern states in the winter and coming back north in the spring. The success of these operations depends upon numbers and volume. Community beekeepers have gone the way of the family farm or the home ranch. Few remain who operate small businesses based upon an intimate knowledge of a limited region, where each colony is managed intensively to wring the maximum crop from the local environment. I am one of them. To survive, overhead expenses are kept to a minimum, and wherever possible, muscle power is used in place of expensive capital investments. I have no employees and except for an occasional hand from my wife Barbara, everything which gets done in my business gets done by me. I am the beekeeper, tax man, and mechanic, the market research department, plumber, electrician, and vet. I make all the decisions as each new season unfolds and I reap the benefits or suffer the consequences. I put in long hours at grueling physical labor and have relatively little money to show for it in the end, and it's just the way I like it. The success of the bees is closely tied to the flow of the season and the health of the environment. Here in Boulder County, the major nectar sources exist primarily as a result of irrigated agriculture. But there are many wild and naturally occurring plants which help sustain the bees from early spring to the first hard frost of fall. These wild plants depend upon the natural rainfall, and while they usually don't yield large quantities of nectar, they provide for the bees' daily needs. When a major nectar source, such as alfalfa, is in bloom, and the bees are bringing the bounty back to the hives, It is what beekeepers call a honey flow. A honey flow can be major or minor, and in fact, most honey flows which occur during the summer are minor. Dandelions provide the first major honey flow of the season, and they have just finished. A good colony can often store from 30 to 60 pounds of honey from the dandelions. This will enable them to continue their spring buildup 
and will carry them through a relative shortage of nectar in late May and early June. During most of the spring, the bees are working a wide range of plants. That is, there are a number of minor honey flows occurring almost continuously throughout the season. As some plants complete their cycle and wane, others appear to take their place. These minor flows will enable the bees to gain from 1 to 3 pounds per day. If the bees were providing for themselves alone, these naturally occurring plants and the minor honey flows they provide would be sufficient. A colony could increase its population and store enough honey in the summer to carry itself through the following winter. So in most years, barring things like severe drought, the bees could take care of themselves and have done so in hollow trees around the county since the 1860s. It is only the surplus which gets harvested, though, and if a beekeeper expects to have a crop to harvest in the fall, the bees must do much better than they would on their own. It is really the alfalfa that is the mainstay of beekeeping in Boulder County in most years, and more specifically, the second cutting. The first cutting is usually a minor flow and goes toward the buildup. It then takes about five weeks for the alfalfa to mature again, and a second cutting is taken around the middle of July. The third and last cutting is taken in September, and if irrigation water is short or the alfalfa hasn't done well for other reasons, there may not be a third cutting. A colony of bees will reach a population low of five to 7,000 bees in late February. When the maples begin to flower in early March, the pollen they produce stimulates the bees to begin increasing their population toward a summer high of about 50,000. The main challenge for a beekeeper is to manage the growth of the colony so it peaks just before the major honey flow begins. If it peaks too soon, you've raised consumers rather than producers. If it peaks too late, then you've missed a portion of the potential crop. So as I begin my work in early March, my efforts are directed toward a window in time in the middle of July, the second cutting of the alfalfa. If everything clicks, the bees can gain 8 to 10 pounds a day from this honey flow, and the flow may go on for up to two weeks. All this sounds pretty straightforward, and in essence it is. But each season has its own personality, and there are many other factors to consider. Boulder County abounds in microclimates, and these can influence an ecosystem in subtle and not-so-subtle ways. For example, Boulder is higher than Niwot, and it is often warmer than Niwot by several degrees in the winter. Because of this, spring is usually a week or more ahead in Boulder. These microclimates influence which plants will be more successful and which less, and they set the clock affecting when the honey flows will begin and end. As I travel the county from bee yard to bee yard in June, I make mental notes on how much of the alfalfa is being cut and the timing of the cuttings. The pattern of temperature and rainfall will influence how a season progresses. A warm, wet spring, for example, tends to speed things along, while a cool, dry one will usually have the opposite effect. Yellow sweet clover can have a major influence on how I approach the season. In the early years of agriculture in the county, many farmers grew sweet clover as a green manure crop. Nobody grows sweet clover anymore, but over the years it has gone wild around the county. It doesn't do well on its own most years, but every 10 years or so, favorable weather patterns will produce an abundance of clover. When sweet clover does appear, it changes the whole management scheme. It is a source of abundant nectar, which results in large volumes of high-quality honey. The flow will begin about the 20th of June and can continue well into August. 
The alfalfa becomes secondary in a clover year, and the challenge becomes one of keeping up with the crop. Because sweet clover has such a major impact, I watch for it closely each season. Near most of my bee yards, I have indicator plots that I can check at this time of year. I look for the health and number of clover seedlings on these plots and try to make educated guesses as to what I can expect. Our last big clover year was 1983, so we are due for another good clover year any time now. I think this might be an above average year for clover, but I'm not ready to begin thinking bumper crop yet. As I work my way through the spring and early summer, I try to meld all of these various considerations. Rainfall, temperature, microclimates, cutting dates, and the presence or absence of various nectar-bearing plants, and make the best decision for each of my bee yards. I'm not always right, but I'm right more often than wrong, and usually have a good crop of honey at year's end. I was asked by a reporter a few days ago what the season looked like. My response was that it was like asking someone what the movie was going to be like after they had seen the opening credits. So far, though, it has been a good spring, a green spring, a cool spring. The dandelion flow was excellent, and we are off to a good start. Working toward the honey flows is an intriguing blend of art, science, and luck. There is much that can happen between now and September, but this is part of the challenge and the fascination that keeps beekeeping interesting. Thank you, Tom. I really enjoyed this last bit that you're saying here, talking about beekeeping being a blend of art, science, and luck. What is the art of beekeeping? I think the art is trying to understand the dynamics of each colony that you work with. There are so many factors that go into success. To take a colony in the spring and bring it along so that you have a, the best possible crop at the end of the season. The art is understanding the bees. I often tell people in the beekeeping classes that I teach that in order to be a good beekeeper, you have to think like a bee. You think of the weather as it affects the bees and their success, and the better you're able to do that, the better you are as a beekeeper. How many years did it take you to get to that point where you felt like you were able to balance observations with your knowledge and your intuition? You know, as I look back, I think that... Uh, for many reasons, it came fairly quickly for me. Of course, my understanding improved over the years, but uh, I came at, a, at an opportune time. I was one of the last community beekeepers who really tried to base a business on the production of high-quality honey. And in order for the business to be successful, that's exactly what I had to do. I had to read all of those things that I've talked about or written about and uh, and be as successful as I could be. And obviously I wasn't successful every time, but the bees and I got along just fine. What you just said is reminding me how beekeeping has changed. When we first started beekeeping, the, the bees multiplied almost magically. The honey appeared almost magically. It was just there. I don't hear beekeepers talking about honey anymore. I hear a lot of beekeepers talking about mites and winter kills. They're also not talking about a lot of things that should be important, and it's become almost overwhelming. The, uh, the potential crop has diminished. The habitat has diminished. The challenges that we face in the pesticide arena have increased enormously. 
many, many things have changed. It's a whole new ball game. Yeah, it is. I was going through some uh, papers last weekend, and I found an old notebook where I used to keep notes about our bee yards in there. Uh And I had little sketches of bees with all kinds of supers. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, we don't see that anymore. Yeah, before this started, my uh, winter losses would have been 2 to 5%. The losses today are generally reported at 30 to 40%, but that comes from the Bee Informed Partnership. If you talk to serious beekeepers, what you find is the annual losses are more on the order of 80% or higher. For many beekeepers, very good beekeepers, conscientious beekeepers, they have 100% turnover in their bee population in the course of a year. Thank you for listening to the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. We publish new episodes on Fridays at noon. Join us next time to hear episode four, Millions and Millions of Bees. In the meantime, hop on over to notesfromthebeeyard.buzz and subscribe.